Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's The World This Week, The World This Week in partnership uh, with The Daily Beast. Christopher Dickey, foreign editor, is with us with us as well. Uh, Emery Demir, former editor-in-chief of Zaman France. Uh, Sarai Suarez, freelance uh, reporter and uh, photojournalist. Uh, and uh, France24.com's uh, Sylvain Attal is with us one week away uh, from the first round of the French presidential election. And, uh, well, everyone's an insurgent. The latest one to surge closer to is, is perhaps closer to Jeremy Corbyn than Marine Le Pen or Donald Trump. We're talking about the communist-backed Jean-Luc Mélenchon. He's uh, putting the far-right leader in the same basket as Thatcherite conservative François Fillon and centrist Emmanuel Macron. Uh, for instance, at a rally in Lille, uh, talking about how when Macron was François Hollande's economy minister, and when he strongly backed the El Khomri labor reform law. If you elect one of those three, you'll be spitting blood. Look what they've set as their agenda already, the war against the poor. After that, a widespread Uberization is in their interest. You've already had a taste of that with the El Khomri law, which we will put an end to. Sylvain Attal. How do you explain the surge of Jean-Luc Mélenchon? Yeah. Well, honestly, it's it's a little bit more complicated than saying he's communist back. You know, it's a, it's, it's really something new and something else. It's, it has much more to do with, for example, what you have seen in Greece with Syriza, for example. And not only that, for example, have, I don't know if you've noticed that this week, for example, Jean-Marie Le Pen uh, went out to say that uh, he had great admiration for the style of Jean-Luc Mélenchon. And he said, he, re he said, I was the first one who went like that, you know, walking on the stage, you know, talking without notes, etc., and doing this kind of effects. There's some, there's, he's a populist, of course, just like Jean-Marie Le Pen was. Uh, another, of course, another kind of... Not from the same side of the political not for spectrum. Not for the same side. Even though they have, you know, some point of convergency between them on Europe, for example, on how we should act on uh, towards Brussels and the treaties, etc. And the other thing is that it's it's spectacular, really, uh, what he has done on the few l last weeks. He was excellent on the debate, for example. He was, you know, really, you know, uh, uh, really excellent. He was the real winner of the debate because he had this, you know, this the uh, la faconde. I don't know how you would, would, would say that in English. You know, this kind of you know, easy spoken, out of the system, and uh, people are, as you said, for example, very much hesitating. They were they were looking, for example, people people from the left. They were looking at Amon, for example. They gave him a chance. A socialist candidate. Yeah, they gave him a chance. Whose, whose numbers know, at, have gone south. Yeah, but he hasn't done a very good campaign. And now that uh, I think the last week will be, you know, very decisive because it's it's doing, it's going to crystallize in the minds of uh, crystallization of is everything. Let's look at the latest poll numbers. It's a four-way race with uh, Le Pen, Macron, Mélenchon, Fillon, all within uh, the margin of error. That's one poll. There there are several others out, and they're all roughly uh, numbers like this. Uh, However, the voters, as Sylvain was saying, they're fickle. They haven't firmly made their mind up. One week to go, Le Monde compiled a tracking poll. That means of, that means that you cannot say anything with this poll. It's, yeah, it's, it's all within, within the, the margin, margin of, of error. error. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So everything can happen. Uh, it's Le like I think it's like Russian roulette with five bullets. <laughs> What's going to happen? Le Monde compiled a tracking poll of only voters. Who, were f who said they were firmly committed. And the loyalty prize goes to, wait for it, Marine Le Pen yeah. and François Fillon, the conservative candidate. Now, this isn't obviously how it's going to turn out uh, a week from Sunday. Uh, but Sarah Suarez, when you look at that, at that and, and you know, the, the volatility of the electorate in this election, what are your thoughts? I must really say that I'm impressed because I never thought Melanchon was going to get where he is. Um, he has done a great campaign, that's what everybody says, and it's true, he has, he has connected with people, and that's something that I, haven't, I don't feel the other candidates have really done. He has this charismatic uh, connection with the, the way the chat, uh, the, the way he speaks, <laughs> the way he says things, the way he speaks 
cash and he, he's not trying to, to make up anything. And that that's something that people like. And, and the populism of his program is just amazing. Um, his friendship the with... The authority uh, also. I think the authority. We've been talking about Erdogan, about world. Trump. There's a tendency, a global tendency in democracies these times. They like. People, people using their, their, their voting power to... I mean, it looks like people are looking for authoritarian forms of, of democracy. For a father, again. I yeah, mean, yeah. we have a problem as a society because everybody's looking for someone who protects us yeah, yeah. from everything. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the citizens need to make decisions and need to make their jobs. They need to, 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 to really do what, what's their job as citizens to exert their duties. Uh, mm. They have duties and they have responsibilities. So, and I, I have the feeling people need to, to do more of that. <laughs> But what he's been doing is really fascinating, the way he, he's, he's dealing his campaign. The use of the media that he's been doing, the social media and, and all he's this He's a very platform. strong YouTube campaign, for He instance. has been amazing on that. That's something I never imagined either from, from, for, a campaign, for a campaign like this one. His campaign team is the best on social media, for example. They're, they're the best on, you know, with the hologram, you remember the hologram. Yeah. Even in, the hologram you know, being... The, being the he's, he's going to do one, I think, just before the, the end of the campaign. He's going, yeah. he's going Well, he's he's going to be in one place and there's going to be rallies in four other places where you see yeah. his hologram, yeah. No, it's, it's a terrific campaign. And then not, not only the style of the campaign, but what he says, for example, what he, if, you, if you hear what he's saying, he says, we're going to have them pay, for example, the guy from the CAC 40. It's the, the kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's striking the table. But that's something, I, I saw a video, 10 minutes of Melanchon speaking, and when you hear what he's saying, mm. you understand what people connect with that. Mm. But when you go deep in the program, and when you see in detail the things that are said there, I mean, the, the, uh, the alliance he wants to do with Venezuela and, and the yeah. Bolivarian coalition, what's that? What that comes from? <laughs> Increased I mean, taxes is... like they're not high enough in mm. France already. Yeah. It's crazy. It's he has crazy. been supporting yeah. Venezuelan's government and think, repression. Think, that's crazy. I, I haven't seen any numbers, but I have the impression from people I've talked to that there's already a lot of money leaving this country because yeah. they look at Mélenchon, Le Pen. Le Pen, who, and Le Pen is, she's a national socialist, right? Mm. Her, her economic policies are very classic, uh, screw the taxpayer, uh, feed the poor, price controls, anything it takes, we'll take care of the poor. It's very much like Mélenchon's mm. policies. In fact, there isn't a lot of difference yeah. between Mélenchon and On economic Pen. policy, not much. No. And uh, on the hashtag uh, World This Week, voters on the right appear to have largely made up their minds. Rise of Mélenchon, weakness of the Socialist Party, and Amon leave the possibility for a surprise on the left. It, it certainly seems, though, that this surge by Mélenchon is energizing conservatives. We saw a, a headline, a, an editorial in the right-leaning newspaper Le Figaro, uh, describing him as as a Maximilien Ilyich uh, Mélenchon, <laughs> and, uh, allusions to uh, firebrand figures from the French and Russian revolutions. I mean, of course, he's a nightmare for the right voters in France. It is true, but let us not forget what happened in 2000. The 12 elections, the last presidential elections, he had also a, a surge in the polls during the last month. So it's not a new thing. It's not a surprise that Melanie... And he finished with 11%. Yeah. Uh, he will probably be the kingmaker between Macron and Le Pen. We don't know yet. But uh, but still, he will create a lot of abstentionists uh, well, for the second tour. If he's not qualified for the if second he's not round, qualified. if he's not qualified, I'm, I'm, I'm very much waiting for his speech, you know, If there's Macron against Le Pen, I'm pretty much waiting for what he's going to say. Well, I think it's striking how little we're actually talking about Macron. Mm. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, it was all Macron, Macron. Now Macron seems sort of just faded into the background. Yeah. His numbers have been static or going down. Mélenchon is the one everybody's talking about. Marine Le Pen, we know, has a very solid base. I don't, that chart you showed didn't surprise me at all. The, her voters are committed to yeah. her. And... And I think the, 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 the progress of Mélenchon is also good for another one, for Fillon, because it has mm -hmm. an effect on, on, on the right. You know, people, for, people that have always voted for the right in this country and were skeptical, hesitating, really shocked by what the, all the affairs around Fillon, if they see what's happening with Mélenchon and says, come on, are we, is there a chance, for example, that we have a second round between Mélenchon and Le Pen, for example? And it can remobilize the, 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 the right uh, around Fillon. I, I want to get back to something you said, Sarah, as far as uh, with Mélenchon surging, are Venezuelans 
paying attention to the French presidential election race. They're doing that. and the Because he's, he's made some remarks talking about the Bolivarian alliance, and uh, he was a staunch supporter of Hugo Chavez. No, and he's been using Venezuelan arguments on his speech. I don't know how he can do that. He That's talks about the recall referendums that you have in Venezuela, saying we should have the same thing here. And this is really a bad time for do, to do that, because Venezuela is really going down the hill. Mm. The situation is going really the worst that you can imagine for the Venezuelan government. So I don't see any smart action on using that. The problem is that the, the information that we have outside uh, about what's going on in Venezuela right now is very few. Now the international media and international community is giving some support. So the international media are talking about what's going on in Venezuela. But Melanchon, you could you can even call him Hugo Melanchon if you want. I mean, mm. he's really getting a, a program that is a lot into into the movement inspired of what Chavez wanted to do in the region. Venezuela and, without the sun and without oil. And the problem <laughs> is that I think French People don't realize that a country can be destroyed. The economy of a country can be destroyed. Not because this is France, we're untouchable and everything is going to be good because just we're friends. It doesn't work that way. You have a, the wrong people in the government and things can go very, very bad. All right, two weeks ago, uh, we talked about Venezuela. Nicolas Maduro told his own Supreme Court to cool it on curtailing powers of the opposition controlled parliament. But the protests have not stopped since. Five killed over that period, and now uh, Hugo Chavez's successor, for the first time facing hecklers in what are supposed to be pro-government strongholds, like earlier in the week in the poor eastern state of uh, Bolivar, uh, state television had to turn away when he started getting pelted uh, from uh, protesters at that rally. Now here's how the president spinned the incident. The Battle of St. Felix, what an extraordinary event. After they all went crazy, saying crazy things, they organized an ambush and the people took charge of undoing it. I want to thank the people of St. Felix. Chris Vicky, your, your reaction to that? Uh, we live in a world of alternative facts, huh? <laughs> I mean, it's as simple as that. If you're a dictator or want to be dictator, you just make up your own information. You put it out there and the people who are sympathetic to you will believe it, no matter whether it has any relationship to the truth or not. People saw on YouTube, people saw videos of what happened. Nobody was deceived about what happened. But he says that and people will, if they favor Maduro to begin with or Chavez, they'll say, OK. Sorry, sorry explain this to us. He backs off on or he gets the Supreme Court to back off on basically neutering uh, the, the parliament, which is controlled by the opposition. And yet the rallies have continued since. Why? Because they didn't completely back off. They back off on part of the decision, uh, but not on everything. So n right now this week is, is a vacation week because it's Easter in Venezuela. So the people are very religious and, and there is not too much going on on the on the institutional side or the government side, but the, the protests and the demonstrations on the street haven't stopped a second. We have been this this week facing uh, the confrontation with the with the with the militaries and the police. There was tear gas thrown by an helicopter in a in a demonstration. Um, there is snipers and and people shooting at the at the participants of the rallies. The situation is really 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 in a big stress right now. So they haven't completely back off. We will see next week how it goes on. Actually, there is two journalists, French journalists, who are in prison. They have been stopped in Venezuela right From now. From the Kappa News Agency. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the situation is really in a, in a top stress, and I believe that things can, should, this is the right time for Maduro to, to make a gesture and, and, and do some smart things, because what he's been doing until now is not really what he should be, uh, the way he should be dealing with the situation. All right, before we go, Many a joke has been making the rounds this week about an airline whose slogan is fly the friendly skies. Wow. A doctor, his face bloodied, dragged off by police from a United Airlines flight from Chicago to Louisville because the carrier had overbooked and wanted to make room for crew. Now, of course, these images went viral in the United States. But Sylvain Attal, why has this story resonated so much outside of the U.S.? Because of the first, because of the video, it went viral. Second, because almost everyone is traveling 
today. And we see, for example, in the website, all the stories about, you know, travel, et cetera, are doing extremely well. Everything that's happening on planes, et cetera, it's doing extremely well on, uh, on, online. And the other thing is that um, it, this is what happened when you, you, you give the leash on people in charge of security. I mean, they're doing almost the most crazy thing, and that's it. That's what happened. The guy, the guy in security, you, you ask him when someone has to, has to get down the plane, find someone, and, you know, stupidly, he applies I, the thing. I think United just did this because they want more people to fly business class. <laughs> nobody, <laughs> nobody gets pulled out of business class like that. No, but seriously, Christopher Dickey, there were pieces in uh, the financial press this week warning that after the travel ban, uh, this could have a serious impact on uh, tourists, which uh, tourism makes up more than 8% of the U.S. economy, uh, that this could have an impact on tourism in the United States. People may not, foreigners may not want to go to the U.S., mm -hmm. Oh, I think that's already happening. I mean, the, the U.S. is sending out signals all in countless different ways, intentionally and unintentionally. We don't want you here, which is ironic, given that our, uh, our president's famous for owning hotels. But that's what's happening. The message is, if you're Muslim, we don't want you here. If you're Mexican, we don't want you here. If you're Latin American, probably we don't want you here. We don't want any of these foreigners in America. And then you have something like this, which says was a huge sensation in China, because although the guy was, in fact, of Vietnamese origin, the Chinese flipped out and said, this is a racist thing, this is anti-Chinese, which is really why the president of, of United Airlines came around and started apologizing, when they realized that they were going to, could lose billions of dollars eventually in the Chinese and, and, market. And he fumbled the apology. Oh, two or three times, two or three times. My favorite explanation was that, that his people were doing following procedures Sure, we've heard that before. They were just following orders, right? Mm. That's what they were doing when they dragged the guy out down the, down the uh, middle of the plane. Mm. All right, on the hashtag world this week, uh, hey, United Airlines, can you send your security to the White House? There's someone there who won't <laughs> vacate a seat. <laughs> the jokes go on and on, Emre Demir. But it, it, I think there's another reason, and Sivet touched upon it, why this story resonates, and that is yeah, air travel, the way it yeah. works today. And... And this idea of being, you know, parked Connected. in your seat and the overbooked flights. And because we're doing it more and more, the airlines don't seem to be keeping up. Yeah, I, I also see in this whole scandal a, a, a huge PR disaster. So, mm -hmm. uh, and it reminds me the the, uh, the Pepsi ad. I, I don't mm -hmm. know if you saw that. Mm -hmm. It was also a major PR disaster. And I think it's it's linked because they have, they have both the in-house uh, PR teams, creative teams, and it creates some sort of a blindness within these big brands, big companies. Uh, the reaction from the United Airlines was incredibly stupid. That we have, <laughs> that's why we have all these uh, reactions. They could have managed it uh, much more rationally. Uh, and I think that it's a, uh, it's a winning argument for the ad agencies. I see this before all of that a, a PR dis as a PR disaster. Sorry, Suarez. Well, I believe we have all been uh, submitted to the tyranny of, of the of the air company sometime. I mean, uh, books, uh, overbooked flights, waiting lists, um, canceled, flights, canceled yes. flights. This is everybody has lived a situation similar to that. So I think we connect to that story, and all sort of of videos have been uh, rebuilt from that making these fake publicities about United and, and how, how yeah, you're parodies. welcome in the in this parodies are just great. And, it, and, it's, and, and I agree, this, this, this could have been deal in a different way, in a different way, sorry, of, of communication, but they, they did a very bad job on that side. So well, it's just the whole idea of dragging people off a plane. Yeah. Right? So the, the obituary of the situation. Yeah. It's just unbelievable. It's like a, a death lottery, but right? Also, I, mean, I like, think on this Trump right. era where, where the racism and, and all these kind of subjects are on the table and very fresh yet, these kind of situations make you think, OK, we are living in that kind of society now. So this is, this is part of the whole package. All right, and it's there for all to see. Uh, the PR disaster, we're going to extend uh, the, the talk about it in a moment. Uh, Sara Suarez, Christopher Dickey, Sylvain Tal. Can I say a word about just the, the vote compass? So, yes, please. Yeah, OK, just the vote compass. It's on France 24 website. That's right. You go straight to it. It's a test. Which I you took yesterday. You can do it even, even if, if you don't have right to vote in France, just to check what candidate you're, uh, you're, you're the closest. It's, it's, it's very funny. It takes only 10 minutes. It's interesting. 
All right, and uh, the vote compass is, uh, is something that I tested out uh, yesterday. Yeah, really? Uh, the, uh, Did it fit? Did it fit for you? Did you discover your Le Pen supporter? <laughs> 